What's the most important question you've ever had to answer? You know, it's interesting how questions work. When you start to think things, I know that we just had someone up here who tried to talk about the San Antonio Spurs a little bit. Uh, so, like, the question that you have to ask is, who is the greatest power forward of all time? And we know the answer. Dirk, that's right. Dirty Dirk, you better believe it. No, it's all good. But when you ask someone the question, like, who's the greatest basketball player of all time? Everybody knows the answer, right? Say it. One, two, three. Michael Jordan, you better believe it. All the way. He is the GOAT. No one can be any better. But you think about some questions that you've gone through in life. I think about probably the most important question I've ever asked. And I remember February 12th, 2005, thinking about how nervous I was because me and my best friend Clayton, who you guys will get to meet tomorrow, earlier that week, I'd gone to a jewelry store and spent my life savings on a ring because I wanted to ask my girlfriend if she wanted to marry me. And I did that on Tuesday, had to wait till Saturday, and I have this ring, and I'm thinking everybody's gonna ruin my surprise, all of this, my wife now, she was going, no one's ever surprised me in my life, so it was a big deal for me to try to surprise her in this, and we're thinking of everything that we can do, me and my friends, of like how we can surprise my wife, and everything went wrong. Nothing went the way that it was supposed to be planned. And so we end up, I asked my wife to marry me in a parsonage, which if you don't know what that means, that's where like a church pays for a little house and little churches, and uh, in a parsonage in Barnsdall, Oklahoma. But nevertheless, I still remember getting down on one knee, my voice shaking, scared to death, trying to say the rehearsed speech that I have and none of it comes out right. And I say, Lindley Pettis, Will you marry me? She said, yes, you better believe it. Look at me. I mean, come on. But, uh, but questions are interesting, but that was not the most important question I had to answer. That happened when I was six years old. And we had had church in the morning, and we came home. My dad was a preacher. We come home and my dad took a nap. We would go back to Sunday night church in those days. And so we're like hanging out at the house and we're supposed to be quiet. And so my dad had written this little book called The First Steps for New Believers. And so as a, a, a six, actually a seven-year-old, I'm looking through this and just figuring out how to read. And I get to this chapter on baptism where you fill in the blanks and you look up things in your Bible. And I'm really into this at this point. And I start flipping through these chapters and looking at my Bible and reading Romans 6, 23 and realizing all these things and filling in these blanks. And I go and I woke up my mom and I said, mom, I've got to get baptized. And she's like, Matt, what are you talking about? You're not old enough to get baptized. You don't know what you're doing. And we're going through this whole thing. And I'm like, no, no, no. I've got to get baptized. I know that I'm a sinner and I need a savior. I need Jesus to cleanse me from my sin. And she's like, Matt, what? wait till your dad gets up and you can tell him. And so my dad wakes up and I'm waiting. And I said, dad, I, I want to get baptized tonight. And he said, all right, well, you're going to have to go up to the office with me. And so we went up to the office an hour early for church and my dad makes sure I know what I'm doing. We go through the whole gospel thing. And I remember at the end of church on Sunday night, walking all the way up that center aisle and saying to my dad, I want to be baptized. And in front of the whole church that night, my dad on Father's Day, with tears in his eyes, says to me, Matt, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and do you accept him as your personal Lord and Savior? You know what I said? Yeah. Yes, I do. And what's interesting to me is what Jesus does with his disciples. In Matthew chapter 16, you can turn there if you have your Bibles. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus asks his disciples a question. I would venture to say the most important question any of us will ever have to answer. 
And what's interesting to me about where Jesus does this is he goes away from where they currently are. You see, what happens in the Gospels is Jesus and his disciples are really starting to, to advance. I mean, they're going through some serious stuff. They're, they're making a lot of, uh, a lot of headway and, and becoming a great movement. And Jesus sees all of this happening, and he says, guys, we need to go on a journey, a three-day journey to be exact, all the way from Capernaum to a place called Caesarea Philippi. He said, well, Matt, why is it important that they're going to Caesarea Philippi? I'm going to tell you. Jesus takes a 23-mile journey, three days, because this question is that important for him to ask, and he realizes, for me to get through to you, I've got, you, got to take you to a place where this all makes sense. You see, Caesarea Philippi in those days was the place where the Jordan, it's still to this day it is, but where the Jordan River starts. If you know kind of the way that Israel is laid out, the tallest mountain in all of Israel is this mountain called Mount Hermon. And the snow-capped mountain of Mount Hermon runs down to Caesarea Philippi, and Caesarea Philippi is where the Jordan River begins. Jordan means from Dan or flows from Dan. This is where the, the, the 12 tribes of Israel, a, a small part of the tribe, they're, they're up here, and from Dan, here comes the Jordan River. That's what fills the Sea of Galilee. We learned about Peter on that this morning, and then it eventually flows all the way down to the Dead Sea. But you can see in this picture, the next one actually shows it better, you can see the river where it forms. They've got these rocks there that actually dam that up a little bit. But when you look up at the very top of this picture, you see this massive rock, and you see kind of that, that cave, that opening inside of it. In the first century, when you would have gone to Caesarea Philippi, this place would have been full of all sorts of pagan temples. There was a god there that they worshiped, and this was actually the sanctuary of Pan. You know, like Peter Pan? Uh, it actually comes from this. The, Pan was the god of scary things, and the way you would worship Pan was through uh, performing all sorts of inappropriate sexual acts with one another, and Pan was this god. When you see the idol that was carved of him, he was half goat and half man. And so in this place, give me that, that third picture. Go to the next one. In this place where this is, this is actually like the, called the Grotto of Pan, but in that spot, they would have had a statue to him. You can see the other places where they would have had this. And a couple of years ago, I got to go to this place and, and check all of this out. And so Jesus takes his disciples up here to this place where you have all this pagan worship. I've got one more picture. This is actually a picture I took of a drawing at Caesarea Philippi of what it would have looked like when Jesus showed up with his disciples. You have the temple of Pan, you have the grotto of Pan, you have the, the, the temple of Augustus, you have all these things. They had a temple there where they would worship Zeus and all these things. Yeah, well, Matt, why does this matter? So where Caesarea Philippi is placed, Mount Hermon is above it, and it flows down to the Sea of Galilee and to the Dead Sea. The, the Jews and, the, and the, the people around there had the same uh, kind of beliefs as the ancient Romans or Greeks had where they believed that gods lived up on the mountains. So you remember Mount Olympus and stuff when you learned that in school. Mount Hermon was the same thing. They believed these gods lived up on the mountain, and then below them, this was kind of the gate or the, the way to the underworld. And if you could show that picture that shows the, the cave part uh, again, that, that would be cool. This, this hole that they had there, can we see it? Not that one, the other one, the one right before it. You can see that big gaping hole up there. This was actually called the gates of Hades or the gates of hell. And so their tradition, what they would do is they would bring people when they died and they would take their bodies and the way that they would worship or, or see if, if the gods accepted this human sacrifice was they would put them in this huge hole and down in that cave, you, you, you still to this day can't see the bottom of it. But they would put someone in there, and if he went to hell or to the underworld, in the Jordan River where you would see that, you would see his blood. But if the gods accepted him and took him to their belief of the afterlife, then you wouldn't see that blood. And so this is the center of pagan worship. And you go, why would Jesus 
bring his disciples here? Well, it's because what he's about to ask them. Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 13, says, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? What a question, right? He says, guys, who are people saying that I am? And they reply back. They say, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And here it is, verse 15. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? The most important question that you and I will ever have to answer, and by the way, at some point, you will have to answer this question, is who do you say Jesus is? C.S. Lewis uh, talks about how, how people answer this question, and people love to talk about Jesus as if he was a really nice guy. I mean, I just think he's a great teacher, or he's a good prophet, and some of these other religions like to say that, and C.S. Lewis says, you can't say those things. Jesus is one of three things. He's either a liar, a lunatic, or he's Lord. You see, because you can't say Jesus is a great teacher because Jesus said some really provocative and honestly inappropriate things unless he is Lord. Like, you don't say, hey, this person's a good teacher if he says, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. But that's what Jesus says. You don't go, oh, man, I I just love his teaching. No, no, no. You can't say that because you have to accept his whole body of work. So either you're saying he's a liar and these things aren't true, all the things that he claims about himself, all the stories that are in the Bible, all that's not true, or you're having to say he's a lunatic. And Jesus just kind of this crazy person that's lost his mind. And kind of the stories in the Bible, when you hear about the resurrection, we're not going to really believe that, right? I mean, the disciples must have stolen his body, and someday they're going to find it. We're going to watch the History Channel exclusive, where they finally find Jesus' bones. And just this whole story that we have written, he must have just been some crazy lunatic guy that convinced 12 people to follow him. And some people believe that. And they think, well, Jesus just must have been a lunatic. But you know what's most probable? Because even if you look at Jesus and you go, well, he's a lunatic, there's too much evidence against that. The most probable explanation is the third choice. Jesus is Lord. And that when you look at Scripture, and he really is who he says he is. And these stories really are real. And you guys were challenged last night to follow him. Not understanding what all that means, and that's fine. Peter didn't get everything right. Peter didn't know all the right things when he chose to follow Jesus. And I'll let you in on a secret. Peter doesn't know what he's doing even after that. Peter gets something right here, but he messes up a whole lot after this. And so what happens, Jesus asks the question, who do you say that I am? And Peter replies, verse 16, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Peter's reply, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. What's interesting to me is the words that Peter uses to describe Jesus. The first one, he says, you are the Christ. That means he's the Messiah. What he's acknowledging there is he's saying, Jesus, I believe that you're the chosen one that everyone's been waiting for. You're the anointed one, the one that we've been waiting for to show up. I believe that's you. We kind of get that part, all right? But the second one is interesting in light of where they're at. He says, the son of the living God. Remember where they're standing. Right here in the middle of Caesarea Philippi, in the middle of all this pagan worship, Jesus has brought his disciples to this special place to ask them the most important question. And Peter goes, you're the son, not of all these dead things that everybody else is worshiping, all these carved idols. No, no, no. Of the living God, you're his son. And Jesus replies to Peter, Simon, 
Bar Jonah, that just means son of Jonah. That's his dad. Flesh and bone, or man, has not revealed this to you, but only my Father in heaven. You see, here's the main point of the text. We find out who we are when we see Jesus for who he is. And what Jesus does with his disciples is he takes them to a place where they can see the difference between him and everything else. You ever wonder why it's important that God brought you here this week? You realize that God's not surprised. God doesn't like look down at you and go, you're, you're in South Padre Island. To, I had no idea. No, God knows exactly who you are. He knows exactly where you're seated. seated. He knows exactly who's by you. He knew all the stuff that was going to lead to this moment right now. Because what I believe with my whole heart is that God brought you to this place. For some of you, it felt like a three-day journey yesterday. Amen? Amen? Because Jesus needs to ask you a question. Who do you say that I am? And what he does for his disciples is he says, guys, I want you to see what the world has to offer. In the midst of all the pagan worship, in the midst of all these false gods, in the midst of all these idols, when all this stuff is going on around them, Jesus standing in between each and every one of them says, guys, who do people say I am? And sometimes we go through this, like Mark talked about this morning, where we put Jesus kind of as this Man, let's, let's make him a king. Let's, let, let's use him in our way. And, and, and God's just kind of be this genie that we go to when we need him and we want something. But the rest of the time, I'm just going to live my life the way that I want to live it. And Jesus zones in on his disciples and asks them the most important question of who do you say that I am? And Peter gets it. And what Jesus says to Peter, I think, is the most important part. When he says, man didn't reveal this to you, my Father in heaven did. You know, there's a lot of times <clears throat> when we have these moments where, where we try to come at things man's way, right? That's religion, where we try to achieve uh, status with God, or we try to make God like us. And so we think that that following after God or making God be happy with me has to do with all this stuff about, man, I got to do all the right things. I got to go to church. I came to a church camp. This is a great week for me. And you're thinking all this stuff, and man, God's going to be really happy with me. That's you trying to, to get to God. Christianity is not that. Jesus is not that. It's not about you trying to get to God. It's about God sending his son to be the Christ, to be the Messiah, to get to you. And what, what Jesus says to Peter, he says, Peter, you got it. That's me. I am the Christ. I am the Messiah. I am the one that my God sent. I'm the son of the living God. Not all these dead things, not all these dead idols. I'm alive. And yet so many times you and I find ourselves in places where we put idols, put dead things before Jesus you just got to wonder if Jesus would ask us that same question. Who do you say that I am? You see, when we see Jesus for who he really is, that's when we find out who we are. In the text, the way this happens is Jesus calls him Simon, Simon Barjona, and he tells him, verse 18, I tell you this, you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You see, what Jesus does for Peter, Peter notices who he is, he sees Jesus for who he is, and he says, you're not Simon, you're Peter. And Peter just means, the Greek word is petros, it means little rock. And he says, and on this rock, he uses a different word, petra, which means this huge rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But Peter gets his identity because he sees who Jesus really is. Kind of cool, right? 
There's a lot of people that look at this and they think this is where Peter's name changed. It's not. You know when Jesus changed Simon's name to Peter? It was in John chapter 1. It was the very first time that Jesus met Peter. His brother, whose name was Andrew, who was one of the first people uh, to, to meet Jesus and be called by him to follow him. And he says, hey, I, I got to go tell my brother. And so he gets his brother, Simon, and he brings him up and he tells his brother, Simon, I think we found the Christ. Come see him. And so he comes up and in John chapter 1, when Jesus meets Peter, now called Simon, Jesus says, Simon, you are now Peter. And from now on, you will fish for men, the story we heard about last night. You see, what's interesting to me, when you look through the Gospels, when you see the Gospels refer to Simon, it's always in the context of his former way of life. It's Simon's boat. It's Simon's mother-in-law's house. It's Simon's partners in fishing or in business. But when you see the Bible, the Gospels, refer to Simon as Peter, it's when he's stepping in to who Jesus knew he could be. And so it's when he says, Lord, if that's you, call me out upon the waters. And Jesus says to Peter, come. When Jesus sees Peter say this in Matthew 16, he's not starting some new thing. It's not like, hey, this is your new name, and from here on out, you're going to be a rock, and we're going to build the church on you, and everyone's going to think that you're the first pope. That's not what Jesus is saying at all. He's saying, Peter, you're getting it. You're who I know you can be. And when he changed his name in John chapter 1 to rock, you know what he says? He says, I see something in you that you don't see in yourself yet. That you can be a leader. You realize that in the Gospels, when it refers to uh, the, the 12 disciples and it lists them out, that every time the first disciple that's mentioned, you know who his name? It's Peter. You realize that there is no other name mentioned as much as Peter except for the name of Jesus. That Peter asks more questions in the Gospels, that, that Peter does more. And sure, Peter messes up, Peter does a lot of things wrong, but what you see in the Gospels is you see Peter stepping into who Jesus knew he could be. And this is kind of his shining moment where he gets it. And when he sees Jesus for who he is, he finds out who he really is. And Jesus says, yeah, you are Peter. On this rock, I could build my church. And did you catch what he said at the end of it? And the gates of hell, can we see that picture again? The gates of hell will not prevail against it. See, Jesus took his disciples on a journey because he had to show them something. They wouldn't have got this if they were in their hometown, if they were sitting there in Capernaum. He had to walk away. He had to take them to this special place so that they could see the difference between Jesus and everything else. And here's my, just my assumption tonight that a lot of you sit in that same place tonight. That for you, when you think about Jesus and you think about him when you're back at home, there's really not that much of a difference between him and every other dead idol that's ever been created. But for some reason, Jesus chose to bring you here. And I want to be the one bold enough to say it's because he wants you to answer this question tonight. Who do you say that he is? It's the most important question you'll ever have to answer. I'm going to ask the band to come back out because what we're going to do tonight is we're going to, we're going to have a moment where uh, we have an opportunity to respond. And what's interesting about our text is when Jesus gives Peter this new name, calls him by Peter, he calls him Petros, little rock. I'm holding a little rock if you haven't figured that out. But you know what's interesting? 
when Peter goes on a few years later and he starts to write about Jesus, he writes something in 1 Peter chapter 2 that I think is, uh, is pretty cool in light of the fact of what Jesus did for him. I want to read this passage for you. 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 4, it says, As you come to him, as we respond, as we answer this question, and we decide, yeah, I believe that's who Jesus is. A living stone, rock, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, all of us, like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices holy and acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. He goes on in verse five to say that the stone that the builders have rejected has now become our cornerstone. And here's what you gotta understand. Peter's name means little rock, but Peter knew full well who he was. He wasn't the main attraction. He wasn't the big deal. He knew who our cornerstone was. He knew the bedrock of our salvation, that that's Jesus. And that even though people have rejected that stone, God has made him our chief cornerstone, that everything else is built upon him. And we want to give you an opportunity tonight to respond to that question and that call. You see, we too, like living stones, are being built up into a spiritual house. And you know what I love about stones? It's different than brick walls. If you've seen, we're in a, we're in a building that's made of it. You can see the walls around us. They all look alike. They are, they're just the same shape. You make them, and man, you can make a building really quick out of these blocks. But stones, rocks, is something totally different. There's no two that are the same. You might have some that look alike, but they all have different imperfections, different shapes, different sizes, different talents, different abilities. They come from different places. And isn't that us? That God's brought us together in a room like this with every one of us having a different story. We come from a different place. We all have our different personalities, our different imperfections. But God wants to build with you. That's why he sent his son. And Peter has this moment where God reveals to him who Jesus really is, and it changes everything for him. And what I would love for you tonight is for you to see Jesus for who he really is, that he's not just some God like other gods, lowercase g, but he is the Christ, the son of the living God. And you know, this idea of rocks or stones, they play a pretty prominent role all throughout the Bible. You have the Israelites, before they go into the promised land, they take these stones out of the Jordan and they set them up, these memorial stones. Probably the most famous story is about a teenage boy who the Israelites are in a standoff with this giant of a man, this Goliath, this Philistine who's bad-mouthing our Lord, who's saying all these things and he's mocking all the Israelites and all the Israelites are just scared. And up walks David, a teenager. He says, guys, what are you fearing? Do you not realize that the battle belongs to the Lord? Do you not realize that the God who is inside us is greater than our enemy? And they're all freaking out. And David goes to the king and he says, I'd like to fight this giant. And what's great is the king goes, you're probably our best option. So he tries to give him all of his armor. He tries to do all this. David puts it on. It doesn't fit. It doesn't make sense. And he goes, can I just take my slingshot? Is that good? And somehow this is the best choice for the entire nation of Israel is a teenager with a slingshot. That's how we're going to win this battle. But David goes down to this little brook that is flowing with water and he grabs five stones and he comes out and you know how David defeats that giant that day? It's not because he's powerful. It's not because he's a great shot with a slingshot. 
David saw God for who he is. And he knew who he was because of that. He knew that God can conquer anything. That this battle's not too big. This giant's not too tall. He's going to fall because God is going to give me victory in this battle. And so a teenager walks in and he slays a giant. And the nation of Israel wins a battle because someone was willing to take a rock and make a difference. And so here's what we want you to do tonight. I want to be crystal clear about this. If you've never given your life to Jesus, we want to give you an opportunity to make your first time decision to follow Christ tonight. And here's the, here's the deal. We're going to ask you to do it with two restrictions. Number one, we're going to ask you to make this decision by taking a rock like this. And you're going to come over and there's this cylinder over here. And there's nothing special about this. Uh, this rock doesn't save you. This isn't the rock. It's just us showing something and being able to do something to say, you know what, Jesus, I'm signing up. I'm giving my life to you. I believe that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And we want you to take this and just put it right in there. Pretty awesome, right? Jolt you a little bit. And here's what's gonna happen all week long from here on out, but tonight, that's the sound it's gonna make. And you know what that's the sound of? That's the sound of victory. You come up if this is your first time. The second thing is we don't want you to come alone. We want you to bring someone with you. But here's what I want you to understand. There's some giants that stand in front of some of us tonight. There's some of us that have been brought to a special place to answer the most important question. And we're looking around and we're seeing all these other things in front of us and going, man, I just don't know how to answer the question. Are you gonna sit back in your seat or are you gonna be willing to stand up and say like Peter, be bold enough and say, no, Jesus, I, I don't believe all these other things. I believe that you are the Christ that you are the son of the living God. If that's you tonight, you come up, there's rocks all around this cylinder, you pick one of those up and you drop it in. And you show everyone, especially our enemy. I'm serious about this. I'm signing up for the rest of my life. I'm gonna follow you, Jesus. Let's stand together, we're gonna pray. And then if you wanna make a decision tonight, you come up and you do that. Let's pray together. Father, you are so good to us. Lord, my prayer that in these moments right now, that you would do some serious work in the hearts of your students, in the heart of your leaders, Lord, in the hearts of your children. God, I know that so many of us come from different places, so many of us come from different situations, but Lord, tonight is the night where you've brought us here for this reason, to answer one question, who do we say you are? Lord, I pray that we would have the courage to follow after you. We would have the courage to, to stand up like Peter and to grab that rock and put it in that cylinder, signifying, Lord, I'm signing up. I believe you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Lord, I know that there could be so many things that talk us out of what you're trying to, to do for us. But God, tonight, I pray that we would see you for who you really are. That Father, just like you did for Peter, that man did not reveal this to them, but only our Father in heaven, and that Lord, you would reveal in the hearts of your children tonight that you are, you are the living God and you did send your one and only son to die in our place to forgive us of our sins so that we could live eternally with you. Father, I pray you give us the courage to respond tonight. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.